what I'm going to do is kind of breeze through some of these things <clears throat> because we've talked about uh, quite a lot of this. <clears throat> but Denali is one of the mountains. It's one of the seven summits. And for those that are in the climbing world, it's become a big deal anymore, the seven summit thing. It kind of drives us park people nuts because um, it's, I think it's just stupid, really. But Because <laughs> um, there's a lot of great mountains. And then, you know, there's, there's, of course, there's going to be always some high point. But I think there ought to be the, the second highest summits, the third, the fourth, the fifth, all the way down the tenth. And then we'll see who does all those. With, with mountaineering through the years, it's like with any activity, everything was left out there. I don't think a whole lot was brought back. Um, and as times went on, you know, there, um, there, there's been changes. And when I first came up on Denali in 75, you know, we, this was one of our folks, we were, it was suggested you burn your trash and um, to, to uh, reduce it down. And, uh, but most people burn it like this one on the left and then just left it. And it, you would find this all over. This, this is by the same rock um, at high camp at 17,000 feet on Denali, 5,200 meters. And uh, it's an incredible desolate um, wasteland up there. And when I first arrived there, climbing through there in 75, it was just a complete huge garbage dump and, and human waste pit. It was just filthy. And um, we were part of a, a, a little cleanup climb that year. We couldn't hardly touch the spot. So the next year we came back um, in 76 and, and started in earnest with a major cleanup. And for the next couple of years did big cleanups through uh, uh, volunteer groups out of Oregon and other places. Uh, the Park Service recommended, uh, you know, the pit latrines for the human waste, and um, they were they were actually a reasonable way to go. In fact, Mount Logan and other big Arctic mountains still recommend the pit latrines for the glaciers. Um, the issue with them is that we do get melt all season, and uh, this stuff does show up on the surface um, at some point. And uh, up high, it stays right in the snowpack, and I can dig down uh, to old toilets all over the high camp area and find poo that has been there 30, 40, even Brad Washburn's poo. So the, the principles that we've been talking about over the last day here um, all came about in the 70s and then the early 80s um, with the formation of Leave No Trace. And um, education seemed like the, the way to make it work. And so this is myself in 82 talking to a Japanese party up at 14,000 feet. Um, and we've progressed to quite a uh, extensive education pro program, you know, at work um, at in Talkeetna, where we, where all climbers come through, through our um, through uh, publication of a booklet that's online, and uh, actually talking to each climbing group that goes through. Um, but the key to the whole program um, is more than just uh, because of the large numbers of people and the period of time we have to go out and the amount of work we have to do. It is volunteers. We would not have a program at all if it wasn't for uh, the volunteer help we have. And with any group that, any of our patrols that we hit up on the mountain, we have one ranger and four or five volunteers, three or, three or four volunteers. And um, they just make a huge difference in, in what we can do, the safety, to be able to clean up places, um, to be able to assist with rescues. And I think it's a very important component. And it, what it also does is it, it brings into play um, uh, getting a lot of folks out there and realizing how tough it is to do these things and proponents of the systems that we practice. Like all the issues we've had, um, recreation isn't slowing down. It's, it's increasing through the years. Um, we actually have a cap limit of 1,500 on Denali. We haven't quite reached that number yet, but I don't think we're too many years off of being at 1,500. We've experimented with all types of toilet systems. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we dug the pit latrines I, I remember digging the first pit latrine at high camp. It lasted four days before the, the hole filled up. And it took us about two hours to dig that hole. And we just said, this isn't going to work. Um, so we ended up with this, this type of toilet for a few years. We had it lined with those biodegradable bags. They would last one week. And then there would be this huge sack that weighed uh, probably 150 pounds. And it wouldn't quite freeze. And you try to move it off in a sled. And it was like a giant bag of jello. And our staff, and I kept trying to push them to do these things, but I, I, I wouldn't, if that bag broke on you, you would be in serious trouble. There's no water, there's no way to clean up, and pretty soon we just had to abandon this whole toilet. But starting in the um, mid-80s, we 
envision people throwing their, their turds into, cur into cur uh, crevasses. And we still actually do this today on a, on a good point of the, what most climbers do. But um, it was a hard sell at first to, to, for anybody uh, to touch the waste and to transport it someplace, especially to shit over a bag and, and try to make it work that way. But it, it has evolved. Um, so we, what, what's come about in, in just the past 10 years is the evolution of new types of plastics, new types of biodegradable bags. Um, we did research on how much stuff was being brought off. We've actually weighed garbage, all garbage coming down, and ended up with uh, knowing how much people generate per person per day. We know how much um, waste people generate per use, so or human waste. So. Um, we, we have all these numbers that we've calculated in small little studies we've done. We've, we discovered that um, in 1999, one, uh, one group out of four left their fuel can, or at least one or two fuel cans behind. And good portions of groups left all their fuel cans behind. And we, Denali climb is, a, is approximately an 18-day climb, and you have a lot of stuff with you, including a lot of white gas to melt the snow. So um, there's no water up there. And um, um, through what's been mentioned already, um, I envision a, a day when we could pack all our waste off to Nally. And um, so in, in the year 2000, on a patrol up the mountain, a three-week patrol, um, I decided to bring all of our waste off. So I bought uh, three um, really firm-looking um, ammo boxes um, from Paul Becker, who's got his stand out front there. And, um, gave those a try on the mountain. Well, we were able to put our weight, poop in them, but they were pretty darn heavy. And uh, of course, the, um, uh, the, the, the turds do slag, uh, slagmite up, so they, um, they, we couldn't move them in the big ammo boxes. So it, I envisioned a round cylinder. So I talked to the manufacturer, these Paul, and he said, well, he had some cans. It was some round cylinders that he could make in two small ones like this. And so uh, the, the big issue here was I needed a couple grand to get these uh, made, 2,500 bucks. Well, the Park Service looked at me like I was out of my mind. Um, so I went, went to the organization that I'd been with since the 70s, um, the American Alpine Club, and um, with Lloyd and others, and they, they helped me uh, get 2,500 bucks, the seed money, to buy these initial 50 Clean Mountain cans, which we named. And uh, these are the ones we used the very first season uh, as an experiment. And... Um, we only got about half of our staff to use them. They were, a lot of our crew were pretty reluctant to shit in a container and then transport it someplace. Um, and, uh, but we did get a total of 27 groups use them that season. And it was enough um, to convince me that it was gonna work. I knew it was gonna work because I wasn't gonna give up. So um, the next year, uh, the Alpine Club and the Access Fund um, put in money and we bought, um, gosh, it was 200, gray, specially made cans. I've got one behind me here. I'll show you a little bit later. But they, um, they actually worked. We provided them at the 14,000 foot level on the mountain. And since our high camp was the worst zone, we wanted people to bring back their waste from the high camp. And by gosh, they, instantly the high camp started to clean up. Of course, there were a few people that um, didn't want to use the cans and it was all voluntary. But we, could, we saw a huge improvement immediately with, um, with a, a firm packable container. And the issue is, yeah, the soft bags are fine, but if you step on them with your crampons, or if you've got 10 days of poo in one of those bags, it's not going to work. Or if you try to cram 10 of those little bags um, in your pack, it's just too much bulk. And so the, these cans are in such a way you can sit on them and, um, and, uh, and go right in them and then be able to pack 10 or 12 days of, of human waste with them. But there was so many more issues than just, I thought, well, this will be great because the cans will solve it all. Well, that's just the start of it. Um, it's convincing people, um, and that very first season, um, I had one guided party. Um, it's American Alpine, um, let's see, AAI, American Alpine Institute. Um, this group was the very first guided party to ever try to use these cans, and they used them most of the way, and I was very impressed with these folks, including clients, to give us a shot. And today, it's just normal practice. But back in, in 2001, when we went for this, um, it was a big unknown. Um, it was also a big unknown whether I'd get foreign people to try it. Um, that very first year, I got not a single foreign person um, to use the cans. Um, but it's progressed today to where everyone is. Um, 
But the cans are packed. This, the green one model we use today, um, it's packed quite, it's up, these are up the fixed lines, up a long, steep ridge, up to the 17,000 foot camp. Um, the climbing is arduous and it's difficult in places, but people do move their waist um, back down from that upper spot. So the tough parts with this whole program have been convincing people, and it was mentioned today about pilots, and definitely pilots have a huge concern with moving human waste in those planes. And um, actually, Jay Hudson here was probably one of the toughest to convince uh, it would work. Um, and eventually, he had a, a total buy-in of the system. But unfortunately, we had the early cans would, would leak in the planes. We did have the cans in plastic bags. They would leak in the bags, of course. Uh, no one likes to see anything like that uh, close to a, a small plane that contamination would wreck the, well, we'd be, Park Service would be out, everything. So um, it, it was tough to figure all this stuff out, but we have come a long ways. We have a two-way vent system that we've invented for these cans that allow both methane to leave the can when it's sitting in one spot, and, and since these containers seal up firmly, um, it allows air to go back in, because as you, though, those that know that come from altitude, your water bottles get really small when you come back down. Well, that was what's happening with the flights back off the mountain. This is 7,000 feet, um, and you'd fly back to Talkeetna, and, and lids were popping off the CMCs and uh, in the plane. So um, the vent system has worked very well for that. And then who in the world's going to deal with these when they get back down to Talkeetna? The first ammo box I had, I just had the, the pumper guy local, he just came and pumped the waste right out of my cans right at the ranger station. I thought, oh, that's pretty slick, but that isn't going to work for every one of these cans. But anyway, in the end, we had, um, what, uh, it's a contract, and um, at this time period, um, they're picked up once a week, um, taken out, and brought back. This is one load from um, one week's round trip cycle. We have a thousand of these CMCs in circulation right now. Um, we have an actual um, um, uh, approved uh, cleaning method that, um, that they're recycled over and over again. And I know we have some of these CMCs that have probably been out 15 or 20 times now. Um, and um, they just keep getting used over and over. We also have come across th this design also we line with a biodegradable bag. Um, the initial biodegradable sacks we tried um, would actually get eaten up in them within, a, within hours. And, um, they would t pull the sack out of the uh, out of the CMC, and the bottom would just stay there, and you'd either be dragging waste across it. Anyway, it was a real a real issue with finding something that worked. We finally have a product that um, works very well for us, and um, it it has a little bit of plastic in it, but it uh, um, it does break down over a period of a couple years. Along with the program, as we advanced along through the years, um, we 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 did it s with incremental steps with initially um, uh, having the cans um, available at base, or at 14, then at base camp, and then we decided well, let's give them to them in Talkeetna and have them return them to us in Talkeetna. So that was pretty slick when we, we put our foot down that way. That was about five years ago, and um, that's what we've done today with, with, with getting the cans in and out. Well, with that, um, just fortunately, the Denali was doing a, a, a brand new backcountry management plan that took about two years to develop. And um, the guy that was working on that plan was in our office all the time. And I convinced him that we had to have the CMC program in the new plan. And um, sure enough, it, it was put in the plan. And now, um, and it's made into law now that uh, you have to have the Clean Mountain cans at high camp. And it, it required to bring the waste down. It still can be crevassed. But all the, lo all the flyout locations throughout the Alaska range, and there's at least 20 or 30 glacier fly-in spots, climbers and backcountry users have to fly their waste out from those airstrips. So the CMC is distributed throughout the Alaska range um, for all groups that are out there. If they have adequate crevasses to crevasse waste, that's still allowed, but the waste is brought down and we do not see the contamination that we used to see throughout the range. Well, we, we were able to put that into law and um, so there is, a, there is a $100 fine if it's not done and that's per person. So we have caught a few groups um, and we cite every person in the group. We also have, when I'm checking a group in, especially with foreign people, they have a hard time kind of understanding um, what I'm talking about or, or even our PowerPoint. But I do make it clear to them that if they want to go to high camp, they have to have their can. So my, my, my saying is, no can, no camp. So, um, and it's that easy.
I've had a few people that said, well, they're not going to take him. And I said, well, there's a lot of other mountains you can go to, too. So, um, and they, they learned right up to that. Watching Dawa's program last night was, was very inspirational to me because he is the guys I'm targeting right now. The young women and, and men out there that are um, our leaders tomorrow. And these are the folks that are they're carrying the banner on. And I just, I think it's fantastic that we're seeing that today. Um, it's lined, this is the bag that we have. We buy these by the case lot um, and have them shipped up. They're made out in Florida. Uh, uh, they're a contract outfit that makes them, and actually their largest sale goes to uh, Norwegian countries, or Norway, Sweden, um, and where there are, there are no plastic or very little plastic allowed in the dumps. They are very sturdy, they won't break, um, and climbers haul them all over in the, in the, in the CMCs. Um, but the CMC is very sturdy, it can be sat on, um, it has a very good strap system designed to be hauled all over the place, carried. They're a little heavy, but the weight is justified because of the sturdiness of it. And I tell you, these have been dropped 1,000 feet down, or 2,000 feet off the head wall, and have gone all the way toward 14. We find them at the bottom. The lids often come off, but we just put it back together and they get, they're get back into use, um, not destroyed. Uh, and um, anyway, they have a good seal. This is that little important vent that's, uh, that makes it all work for altitude and methane. The original, the original cans had this little foam, and um, yeah, that worked. Uh, this worked good for a while, but it, you couldn't line the can because of the, uh, the inside edge. It was tough to pull a bag out, and the foam, the little foams would blow away. And I realized early on that that wasn't going to be a successful operation, especially in a windy environment. But if you're not in a windy environment and you are cleaning these yourself, this is a, this is a lighter uh, version of the same model, and that foam seat is pretty nice. Why not institute the Clean Mountain can the whole way down to the bottom of the hill? That's the buy-in factor, and um, I would like to see everybody pack all their waste off, but <clears throat> it's not an easy sell. You know, I, when I, for, the, I, I've been working with Denali, it's my 31st season with Denali, and um, I've seen a lot of our folks come and go through the years, a lot of the seasonal staff, and um, today we have a whole new crew of staff that's uh, and guides that guide on the mountain and, and younger climbers that have never seen anything but the clean mountain can uh, uh, in the range. They would, be a, they would be shocked if you didn't pack your waste, at least use the can. And, um, and I think we'll, we'll see the day when that, that can happen. I know we've had Dave Hahn and others have packed all their poo off from guided trips on the mountain, and, uh, but we're not quite there yet. And it, it's a buy-in with everyone. Plus, we need a lot more cans. It would be two cans per person, and they'd be heavy coming off. But uh, uh, like uh, the glacier is a river, you know, and, and you put that sled on, the, you put, your, put these CMCs on a sled, you can haul, haul them right on down. But it'll take, it, 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 it's, it's not an easy thing when you're hauling, say, 18 days of poo back to base camp. So it's, 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 you generate about a half a pound per person per day um, on the average. And... Um, of course, that's only a quarter of the weight of your food. So, I always tell people that that uh, you're, you know, you're only bringing back a quarter of what you took up. So, and climbers are and also climbers are strong. You know, I look at most of these folks as being well, they could easily do it. But it's all up here, and it's all with convincing management, and um, it'll happen someday. But and this is where I'm hoping we'll find some evidence that yeah, there there is biological activity in this poo that's thawing out too.